Clean Energy Solution Center in partnership with the 21st Century Power Partnerships Distributed Generation Campaign. Today's webinar is focused on interconnection of distributed generation, technical and regulatory aspects. Before we begin, I'll quickly go over some of the webinar features. For audio, you have two options. You may either listen through your computer or over your telephone. If you choose to listen through your computer, please select the mic and speakers option in the audio pane. If you choose to dial in by phone, please select the telephone option, and a box on the right side will display the telephone number and audio pin you should use to dial in. If you're having any technical difficulties, you can use the help, go to webinars help desk with the, for, excuse me, with the number on the screen. If you'd like to ask a question, you can ask the question at any time during the webinar. Um, there's a question pane on the right side where you may type it in. The audio recording and presentations will be posted to the Solution Center training page within a few days of the broadcast and will be added to the Solution Center YouTube channel where you'll find other informative webinars as well as video interviews with thought leaders on clean energy policy topics. Finally, one important note of mention before we begin our presentation is that the Clean Energy Solutions Center does not endorse or recommend specific products or services. Information provided in this webinar is featured in the Solutions Center Resource Library as one of many best practices resources reviewed and selected by technical experts. Today's webinar will address DG interconnection processes and discuss approaches for mitigating impacts of distributed generation, distributed energy resources, excuse me, DERs. Before we jump into the presentations, I'll provide a quick overview of the Clean Energy Solutions Center. Then following the presentation, we'll have a question and answer session where the panel will address questions submitted by the audience. At the end of the webinar, you'll be automatically prompted to fill out a brief survey as well. So thank you in advance for taking a moment to respond. The Solution Center was launched in 2011 under the Clean Energy Ministerial. The Clean Energy Ministerial is a high-level global forum to promote policies and programs that advance clean energy technology, to share lessons learned and best practices, and to encourage the transition to a global clean energy economy. 24 countries in the European Commission are members contributing to 90% of the clean energy investment and responsible for 75% of global greenhouse gas emissions. This webinar was provi provided by the Clean Energy Solutions Center, which is an initiative of the Clean Energy Ministerial. The Solutions Center focuses on helping government and policymakers design and adopt policies and programs that support the deployment of clean energy technologies. This is accomplished through support in crafting and implementing policies related to energy access, no-cost expert policy assistance, and peer-to-peer -peer learning and training tools such as this webinar. The Clean Energy Solutions Center is co-sponsored by the governments of Australia, Sweden, and the United States. The Solutions Center provides several clean energy policy programs and services, services included, including a team of over 60 global experts that can provide remote and in-person technical assistance to governments and government-supported institutions, no-cost virtual webinar trainings on a variety of clean energy topics, partnership building with development agencies and regional global organizations to deliver support, and an online library containing over 2,500 clean energy policy related publications, tools, videos, and other resources. Our primary audience is made up of energy policymakers and analysts from governments and technical organizations in all countries, but we also strive to engage with private sectors, NGOs, and civil society. A marquee feature of the Solutions Center provides is a no-cost expert policy assistance known as Ask an Expert. The Ask an Expert service matches policymakers with more than 60 global experts selected as authoritative leaders on specific clean energy finance and policy topics. For example, in the area of distributed generation, we are very pleased to have Ryan Cook, Senior Associate at CAD CADNIS, serving as one of our experts. If you need policy assistance in distributed generation or in any other clean energy sector, we encourage you to use this valuable service. Again, this assistance is provided free of charge. If you have a question for our experts, uh, please submit it through our simple online form at cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash expert. We also invite you to spread the word about this service to those in your networks and organizations. Today's webinar, we have a wonderful panel, and I'd like to briefly introduce all of our panel today. 
um, to introduce an overview of the topic, we have Julieta Her Heraldas, who's a senior research engineer in Power System Engineer Center at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, or NREL, where she currently leads microgrid and smart grid and grid integration related projects. In recent years, Julieta's focus has been on integrating emerging, emerging technologies such as PV, energy storage, microgrids, and distributed um, systems. Following Julieta, we will hear from Ignacio Romero, who is the Director of Distributed Generation at the Undersecretary of Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency of Argentina. He oversees the development and implementation of Distributed Generation Program at the national level, participating in, from the formulation of Law 27.424 up to its associated regulation and implementation. After Ignacio, we will hear from David Parsons, who is the Chief of Policy Research at Hawaii Public Utilities. David is responsible for policy analysis and strategic planning for achievement of the state's aggressive clean energy goals. He oversees the Commission proceedings on renewable energy procurement, distributed energy resource integrations, demand response, long-term system planning, grid modernization, and utility business model transformation. And our final speaker today is David Brown, who is a principal um, distribution system engineer at Sacramento Municipal Utility Di um, District, which is also referred to as SMUD. His 35-year career has included distribu um, distribu distribution, excuse me, system capacity planning, overcurrent protection design, dis um, dispersed generation interconnection, re reliability planning, distribution automation project management, and technical support on a variety of R&D projects. And with those very brief introductions, I'd like to welcome Julieta to the webinar to introduce our topic. Julieta? Thank you. And uh, thank you for having us. Uh, I'm going to introduce first um, the distributed generation campaign, and then I'll introduce the topic. Um, so let me share my screen. And let's see if we can see it in, there you go. So um, before I introduce the topic today, I wanted to talk about the 21st Century Power Partnership, which is one of the initiatives of the Clean Energy Ministerial that Kate introduced. And it aims at accelerating the global transformation of power systems. And so the Power Partnership is a multilateral effort of the Clean Energy Ministerial and it serves as a platform for public-private collaboration to advance integrated policy, regulatory, financial, and technical solutions for large-scale deployment of renewable energy in combination with deep energy efficiency and smart grid solutions. So in May 2018, at the Clean Energy Ministerial 9 in Copenhagen uh, conference, Mexico launched a campaign with the 21st Century Power Partnership and this is what we call the DG campaign, officially called um, the campaign for accelerating the adoption of distributed generation in, in strategic regions. And it's a 12 month campaign that was supported by Germany, Denmark, Chile, Brazil, and India. And NROL, the National Renewable Energy Lab, is the operating agent for the 21st Century Power Partnership Initiative and the DG campaign. And so this DG campaign has focused uh, in Latin America specifically and has had the following activities, a needs assessment for the Latin American region, a technical policy and regulation study tour with representatives from 11 countries uh, traveling to the US. I was lucky enough to be able to um, be part of that study. And uh, we visited Colorado, Arizona and California, and I always joke um, that next time we'll have to go see you, Dave Parsons, in Hawaii, hopefully. <laughs> but we didn't get that pulled through. Uh, other things, uh, participation in regional forums um, in Uruguay, Brazil, and Chile. Two webinars, so the one we had a before on utility-owned um, PV systems or DG, disability generation systems, and this one on interconnection. And uh, finally, a thought leadership report that will be released at the Clean Energy Ministerial 10, which is uh, happening in Vancouver at the end of this month. 
So with that, I'm going to introduce the topic of today, which is uh, really um, DER system interconnection topics. And uh, I borrowed some slides of my colleague, Mike, Mike Cunnington, that has also been involved in supporting the DT campaign. And so to introduce the topic, uh, I think the first slide is a really good um, illustrative example of uh, the topic because it really involves a lot of pieces. And so I think the puzzle um, image is very well uh, done here. So it includes rules, procedures, agreements uh, that typically come in cooperation with uh, federal, state, uh, public utility commissions, so regulatory bodies and uh, utilities, and then the market uh, themselves, so DG developers and customers. And so um, it really involves uh, quite a bit of stakeholder engagement. It's not just the technical part or the managing the applications part. It's also um, quite a bit of stakeholder engagement to make sure that everybody is on board, that the rules and um, application and processes are transparent. And that is really what I, I believe that I've seen that makes um, an efficient and successful DER interconnectional process. So uh, one of the key things um, of the puzzle that are it's very important that then NREL has been focusing on uh, providing support to the DG campaign and also in general in, in the work we do in the US is codes and standards. So I'll talk a little bit about that, um, which is really what um, makes uh, a, that everything can work together in a coordinated and, and safe manner. So um, I'm going to introduce the concept of a, the interconnection process, so the utility interconnection process. Um, I wanted to note that um, typically to interconnect a DR, there are two parallel processes that will happen. One that is not shown in the slide, which is um, permitting and inspection a approval process, which that happens with a local a jurisdiction or authority where you can interconnect your DR. And then the second um, approval process that happens in parallel is the utility interconnection process, and it's what we're going to focus on today. Uh, they're both happening in parallel, and they're both very important, and they both need to be completed to obtain the final permit to operate. But here you can see uh, some of the things. Um, this is this particular image is taken from the um, one of the federal uh, interconnection processes defined in the U.S., which was actually defined after a lot of the states had done their own uh, processes. But I think it's a good example of um, some of the steps that go into the utility interconnection process. So you typically start with an application, and then um, typically, utilities in the U.S. and all over the world, they're trying to define some type of fast track screen that makes it easier to go to the approval box shown there below. Or if you fail the fast track screen, then you move into the supplemental review screens. Um, and if you fail those, then you have to move into the more expensive, time-consuming impact studies and field verification data for uh, approval or if for recommendation of a mitigation strategy. So I think one of the things that is very important to think in general with DR interconnection is how to improve the fast track screens and make them um, make them specific to the conditions that the distribution utility company is seeing and try to learn from that to also inform the supplemental review screens. And, um, I think that's one of the key things that uh, we've been all working on um, to improve um, and is to develop more uh, specific uh, supplemental and fast track screens that actually um, give less false positives um, that then have to go into impact studies and more expensive and, um, and make it easier for and remove barriers for interconnection. So um, some types of fast screens are based on system size, as shown below, and uh, some other ones that you'll hear. I think I have, yes, this next slide, um, uh, I think these are the 10 ones included in the SGIP um, process uh, defined here in the U.S. 
Um, and they, they are not perfect. Um, as you can see, the 15% capacity penetration metric is still there. Uh, and we know it's conservative. And so I think this is one of the key things that utilities across the world have to think of, and it's um, looking at their own experience and what specific rules they can uh, define um, for the interconnection process. So uh, just common utility concerns uh, that we've heard here in the US and across the world really is the main one is voltage regulation. Um, so that is, you know, when the DERs inject power into the grid, and uh, especially the load is not that high during the day, it can cause a high voltage, and that is a concern. Protection coordination is another one, but that one is uh, has been, I think, easily uh, solved, so you may have to adapt the protection schemes. And then some other ones are, are listed there, but a, a common one is also simply um, thermal overload. So um, if when there's enough PV penetration, you start uh, really overloading the um, the, the lines and the transformers. I have here some common mitigation uh, tools and strategies. I won't go through them. Um, I did want to mention uh, this new report that was uh, recently published, and I think it's excellent. It's NREL and its partners here in the US um, of an overview of interconnection, uh, best in, uh, practices for interconnection. And it really does a really good summary, and it covers both uh, the technical side that I was mentioning, so the technical screens, but also um, best practices for interconnection application uh, procedures and management, so how to manage really the large amounts of, uh, of applications. It covers advanced inverters, uh, standards, and also um, strategies and upgrades for um, distribution system impacts, as well as a very interesting topic, which is cost allocation of uh, the necessary upgrades. Um, so I think, um, you know, for all of them, the, the countries developing these policies, I think it's a very interesting report that I recommend you all uh, to read for uh, getting ideas and the lessons learned in this topic. How am I doing on time, Katie? Oh, you're doing wonderfully. Good. <laughs> so um, last thing, I think one of the important things that we've been working on is uh, smart inverters as one of the um, mitigation strategies in the toolbox for integrating DER. And so it's really that the uh, inverter, which is the main equipment that uh, transforms, right, the power from a uh, DC from the solar panels to AC, so it conditions it for the, for the grid, uh, that um, equipment can provide actually grid friendly functions. And so it can uh, help support um, some of the impacts that the DERs cause. And so uh, we highly recommend, you know, uh, countries as they're developing their interconnection um, policies and, and rules to, to think about uh, DERs. And I think we'll hear a lot more um, from our panelists in the US on this topic. And so uh, one of the uh, major achievements here in the US last year was the revision of uh, IEEE 1547. Uh, so we reviewed the, the version, the 2003 version, that the philosophy of the 2003 version was to have DERs interconnect and only inject power, but not to do anything with regulating voltage and frequency and disconnecting as soon as they're there's an abnormal condition like a fault on the grid. And so the big philosophy change with the revision of 2018 is that the more, um, so these resources can actually provide a grid friendly functions and, and, and stay online when there's a fault. And the more of these resources there are on the grid, the more important it is to do this, right? And so the classic example is uh, the right through capability, right? Imagine. Uh, Hawaii now their distributed energy resource. So PV is a residential PV if you aggregate it is their single largest generator. And so if there's an abnormal condition and you lose all of the rooftop PVs, you're suddenly making the condition worse instead of uh, maybe staying online until the the condition is clear and making the grid um, more stable through it, throughout. So those things are I think important. Um, and especially, of course, in island systems that see these impacts first. 
Final observations, I think what we've learned, uh, at least in the, in the US, is that distribution systems in general can absorb quite a bit of DERs. And uh, before really um, um, getting into these uh, high penetration PV challenges, so, um, so yes, in, in general, the grids uh, and PV in the, the distribution system is robust enough to, um, to integrate large amounts of, of PV. Um, as said, smart inverters uh, can help increase the hosting capacity. And um, typically, the way they're being implemented right now is still with no communication required to these, um, these resources. And so the, um, the DERs or the PV systems provide these functions locally based on their local measurements of, for example, voltage and frequency. Um, and then in the future, we'll see probably more and more, um, you know, advancements in grid modernization in the distribution system and probably a communication and central a control schemes uh, with such DERs. And I think with that, I'm going to pass it on to Ignacio. Um, Romero that's going to talk about uh, his experience directing the um, uh, distributed generation in Argentina. Wonderful. Thank you, Julieta. And as Ignacio um, sets up his screen to present and we pass the mic to him, I just want to remind our attendees that they can ask, ask a question anytime using the question pane. Um, and now with that, I would like to welcome Ignacio Romero to the webinar. He is the Director of Distributed Generation um, for the Undersecretary of Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency of Argentina. Ignacio, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Hello, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure being uh, able to, to share some of what we're doing here in Argentina. Give me one second, please. I'm trying to set up the file. It's wonderful. Um, we can see your screen, so okay. I think you're all set. Here we go. Okay, I, uh, I will uh, try to give a brief uh, or as, as brief as possible overview of what has been happening in Argentina in the last uh, three years uh, with the distributed generation law uh, as a context to the discussion on the interconnection uh, procedures and standards, which is, uh, I think, uh, as, as um, Julieta mentioned, key in uh, enabling and accelerated uh, implementation of distributed generation or distributed energy generation, I'm, I'm sorry, energy resources. So, um, as I said, first, as a context, uh, we now have, uh, since uh, 2000, the end of 2017, a national law in Argentina enabling uh, distributed generation. Basically, uh, we have decided uh, of um, going forward on a net billing scheme. This is a, a scheme in which the, uh, the excess energy is rewarded to the distributed generator at the wholesale price. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about why we chose that. Some other important uh, characteristics uh, of the law is that uh, it uh, establishes that the user will have uh, at least, um, he, he has the, 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 the right to request or to connect at least uh, up to his um, contracted capacity for demand. So this is really important. So uh, we can set line on the system sizes and uh, make the discussion between utility and users easier. Easier, of course. There's also uh, some promotional incentives. It's a pretty comprehensive toolbox with um, the, the incentives that we're used to to see elsewhere: financing, um, different uh, rebate type. Uh, um, incentives, also tax credit certificates that could be used to to, to foster this uh, the start of this uh, of the implementation of the law. So the main objectives, of course, uh, we're all aware of, of what they are. Uh, we all know the the battle that we're giving to climate change, and I'm not going to go a lot uh, further in that direction. Promotional incentives, as I said, uh, basically financing options, tax credits or certificates. 
something that's also important and actually has to do with the implementation is that we enacted na national tax exemptions for for excess energy uh, basically something we uh, most people at least don't realize is that when you are a dg user and you're trading energy with the system you are not only buying but you're also selling so a lot of taxes um, related to the sale of goods um, apply such as income tax and uh, value added tax in this case we have uh, included an exemption in the law to, uh, to to this uh to this injection to this activity so it makes it a lot easier um it's, it is not only a promotional incentive but it also makes it a lot easier administratively because if not the um the tax uh authority would have to be uh would require every single user which could be household uh to to register uh this activity this economic activity of uh gen generating and selling energy uh and and that that's a lot of there's a lot of um bureaucracy involved that uh is not justified at all for a small to medium system also we have a set of supply side incentives uh we are trying to look for the most ways in which we can uh, uh, develop a local industry uh, related to distributed generation so we all know the services associated with these activities are really really have a, a really big potential we're also looking into uh, different companies uh, that are developing uh, inverters or structures some also um, solar panels uh, not not as much as the other two but uh, we have a, in the law we have a certain mechanisms that will make them make it easier for them to acquire um, some uh, machinery and 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 uh, start their, their their investments. So now going on to the regulatory part, uh, the one of the key aspects of the law is why in a building. Basically, we came the the the, the original project or the original draft for this law was net metering class uh, feed-in tariff, which, is, uh, which are two mechanisms that have been used and are widely used today uh, all over the world. Now we analyzed um, the, the different, uh, let's say, problems or shortcomings more to say uh, on these uh, mechanisms and uh, decided to go with net billing. Basically, we saw that feed-in tariff was a really, really good mechanism at first to um, to incentivize the early adopters with a huge uh, subsidy and uh, had no relationship or almost no, yeah, basically no relationship with the, with the market uh, signals as of uh, price of energy. Uh, net metering did uh, was was a great step forward uh, in that sense, as it uh, requires less subsidy from the government let's say from tax taxpayers but uh there are some questions as to the cross subsidization between ratepayers and in argentina uh, we are coming from um, a situation in, the, in, in which uh, we had uh, heavily subsidized electricity tariffs uh, up to 90 percent subsidy in some cases so it was really really hard to push for a law that uh, that already included more distortions or was perceived as including more distortions into uh, the mix the net billing uh, scheme basically as we said uh, all energy that the user demands from the grid is paid at the actual uh, regulated tariff that applies all excess energy is rewarded at a wholesale price, which is basically the avoided cost to the utility. Um, so they're, they're in, Argentina, in the case of Argentina, we are paying the cost of, uh, the average cost of generation at the wholesale market plus the average cost of, um, of transport, which is exactly the price the utility pays when they purchase the energy. So for the utility, it's uh it's almost uh it, it has almost no impact to purchase this energy from the distributed generator or business as usual from the from from the market 
Something that's really interesting about the net billing um, mechanisms is that uh, it provides a healthy price signal. So we have a demand, uh, the, the excess energy is rewarded at less, at a lower price than uh, demand avoidance, let's say. So if you could use your energy, you're saving more uh, instead of uh, just injecting. So you avoid incentivizing over dimensioning of the systems and over generation, which is something that will complicate uh, the discussion on the, on the grid uh, requirements for the systems. And also it provides the, the correct signal, price signal for storage and for energy efficiency in the near future when this become, when, when storage principally becomes uh, cost effective or accessible uh, widely. So um, basically we're going to net billing. Uh, something that's interesting too is that uh, as we avoid most of the cross subsidies with net billing, the incentives are a lot more transparent. So uh, the, the end user or the beneficiary knows where the subsidy is coming from and doesn't assume uh, things that are not correct. So now moving on to the um, regulatory update. So after the law, I'm just going to go through the main points because uh, I want to take some more time on the authorization process and, uh, and the, the key part. So basically we set a target of 1000 megawatts of capacity by 2030. Uh, we also define user categories based on capacity. We'll talk a bit more about on that, but we define the fast track for small and medium sized systems. And also we define a maximum system size of two megawatts for distributed generation. Everything above, anything above two megawatts would uh, have to go to the wholesale market. And there's already a lot of regulation available for those, uh, for those generators. We also enacted the web plat a web flat platform for implementation of authorizations and we're moving forward on the creation of, of the implementation of the um, incentives um, as well as setting up the safety standards and technical requirements. So just going for the more detail and I think this is uh, the where, where we can talk more about the interconnection requirements is Basically at this point, we already have a full online authorization uh, process implemented. We implemented uh, these, uh, these procedures uh, nationwide. So basically any user with a, with a national ID can log in and request authorization to become a distributed generation. This is really important because uh, it, it allows us uh, to, to, to be very transparent about this process. So this, this, um, this platform inter uh, make, uh, provides the, the, the medium of interaction between the utility, the, the user, and also the installer. So the regulator can, can oversee everything that's going on and not only uh, the cases in which there's, uh, there's a problem. But basically something that, uh, that is really important is that as we defined all of the all of the system side requirements and, and, and the grid side requirements for these approvals, uh, we are using, using web forms. It's, uh, it's a lot easier to make sure that the user knows uh, all the information that needs to be provided and provides that information. Also, that the utility knows all the information that is required and uh, to, to make the evaluation and, uh, and, uh, and can work on that. So I think uh, it's not only the, the transparency, but also the formalization and standardization of the process uh, to, to make it uh, easier for them to evaluate and not uh, uh, have to sign off on something that they're not sure if it complies or not. Something that's also important, of course, is that with this uh, full online authorization process, we also have uh, trace, traceability for uh for for all these tax exemptions and also we'll have a record we have a registry uh, of distributed generation users in argentina which would be used for future uh national dispatch planning when this grows up and becomes relevant so moving on to um what's required from the grid side and system side um uh, i'll start with system side which is the easiest 
see, for system side requirements, basically there's a lot of uh, information available and we use the standard uh, industry best practices. There's uh, something that we that we allowed on the regulation, which is basically our our um, our way of setting up these standards is that we set up uh, minimum requirement, minimum safety and protection requirements, but local authorities uh, could request uh, something else. I mean, not not different, just uh, incremental. The reason for this is that there, there is a lot of um, there is there is not a, a really good understanding of of, of the impact of these uh, technologies, and we we know the impact is is, is not really uh, detrimental to the grid, but not a lot of people or not a lot of the regulators have actually experienced uh, or the utilities have actually experienced dealing with these systems on their grid. So we wanted to make sure that they they had the the peace of mind in knowing that they could request something else, but they, we, we already know they'll they'll find that unnecessary. Also, we set up a qualified installer requirements, which is basically the person who assumes all the liability uh, on the uh, protections and, and safety of the system, and we made that clear in the law. For component system require, safety requirements, we use the IEC or local uh, standards, which are used uh, widely. Then moving to the grid side requirements, uh, as I said, we set up three different categories of the street generation user. Basically, as I as I mentioned at the beginning, we have uh, an upper limit, which is the, um, the the capacity contract that they have for demand. But also, we set up uh, three different categories depending on their system size. So we have an a uh, small, medium, and large uh, DG user up to three kilowatts, up to three from three kilowatts to 300 kilowatts, and then from 300 kilowatts to two megawatts. What this allows uh, us to do is, especially or specifically in the case of uh, in the case of solar PV, is to uh, go on uh, into a lot more simplification in the process because there's a lot of problems that are general or problems or concerns that are general to uh, distributed generation technologies, but are already solved and actually being improved as, uh, as was mentioned earlier with smart inverters and, and different technologies for solar PV. So there's a lot of problems that are non-existent for solar PV because the technology has uh, advanced uh, uh, enough or because there's enough experience uh, on different uh, countries or regions with uh, with different uh, penetration levels and we already know that's not a problem. So basically we focus uh, on solar PV for simpli simplification of the process even further. We set up um, automatic approval um, thresholds. Basically what this means is that if you require uh, authorization to install a system of up to three kilowatts, typically a uh, residential user or small residential user, your, your request, uh, of course, provided you comply with all the system uh, safety and quality requirements, will be approved automatically until 20% of the secondary circuit capacity is met. So uh, after that, the utility will uh, will be uh, we'll be allowed to go into the um, the, the, the studies and, and and check what the impact is, but uh, but we know for certain that with 20% of these size systems on a, on a secondary circuit, we won't have any problems. Uh, the same for for the case of um, the medium systems, we put uh, a more conservative figure of 10%. And then uh, from 300 to 300K to two megawatts, there's no um, automatic authorization procedure. So I, I guess that the point in this uh, in these fast tracks is that there's a lot of things that we know that are not going to happen. Sorry. Uh, but we need to really be able to prove that uh, that won't be a problem at all. So, so we analyze demand uh, curves and uh, and the systems. Um, 
as you can probably imagine, a 20% reduction in demand uh, on midday will not be critical, uh, especially if it's optimized to any uh, grid operator or any grid. And uh, and also we can discuss uh, a bit more uh, on the on the question phase, but also on the protection side, there's a lot of these uh, issues that uh, are non-existent or very very easy to to work around. So as uh, very briefly, next steps and current status. Basically, we have, as I said, the oper the online platform is operational and the different jurisdictions are adhering and implementing. We already have uh, five major utilities online, which represent 45% of the 16 uh, million uh, electricity users that we have in Argentina. And we're working on the other renewable energy technologies, uh, micro hydro, wind, uh, low power wind uh, uh, generators, etc. to include those. Of course, it won't be as simplified probably as solar PV and while well, I'm implementing all the promotional and financing uh, and, and tax credit certificates for, for, for pushing forward these, uh, these implementations. We're also issuing a lot of documentation that I can comment uh, later because I think my time is up. Uh, but um, but uh, we're we're also drafting and issuing a, a lot of reference uh, information for all the different stakeholders. And uh, stakeholder engagement is really critical to to the success of this implementation. So we're working a lot with the different. Uh, parties uh, to 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 make it easier for them to to adjust and implement this uh, this new regulation. With that, uh, thank you very much. I will pass the uh, mic to the to the next person. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ignacio, um, for your presentation. We are now going to pass the microphone over to Dave Parsons. Um, Dave is the Chief of Policy and Research for Hawaii Public Utilities Commission. So Dave, welcome to the webinar. Great, thanks very much. Um, oh, I think, let's see if I can. Okay. Um, good afternoon, and, and thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Uh, my name is Dave Parsons. I'm Chief of Policy and Research with the Hawaii Public Utilities Commission. I'm very excited to be with, with all of you this afternoon and, and to share some of what the PUC is working on uh, to help achieve Hawaii's clean energy goals. And in my, my presentation this afternoon, I'll, I'll discuss a bit about Hawaii's historical and, and future projected renewables growth um, as well as distribu distributed energy resources, integration challenges, and, and several critical policy developments we are undertaking um, here to facilitate the transition um, of the electricity system. And just a quick disclaimer, uh, my, my comments and opinions are my own and may not necessarily reflect uh, the views or policies of the commissioners. So just a bit of background, um, Hawaii has some very aggressive clean energy policies, including a 100% renewable portfolio standard by 2045 and a 4,300 gigawatt hour energy efficiency portfolio standard by 2030. Um, each of the islands is moving rapidly towards these, these overarching policy objectives. And just to provide a little bit of background or, or context, Hawaii has six main islands served by uh, electric utilities and each of these islands is electrically independent um, and the electricity demand on the islands varies quite a bit. Um, our smallest islands um, in terms of electricity demand have peak loads on the order of five megawatts. Um, and our largest island, um, Oahu, uh, where, where the city of Honolulu is, where I am, um, has a peak load of a little over uh, 1,200 megawatts. Uh, and at the end of 2017, uh, Hawaii had achieved about a 28% overall for the state towards the renewable portfolio standard of 100%, and more than 2,000 gigawatt hours of, of first-year energy savings towards the energy efficiency standard. Um, and so this is this is remarkable progress, um, and we, but we still have a long way to go. And it seems like um, every time we you know we we hit some new milestone. Um, there are new challenges that, that seem to emerge on the horizon that we continually have to evaluate and address. 
So to provide a little more detail on uh, the types of renewable energy resources that we have here in Hawaii, this, these charts are for the Hawaiian Electric Companies, which serve about uh, um, the five of the five of the six main islands, about 95% of the population. And as you can see, they're increasing their percentage of sales that are coming from renewable energy, and this has been predominantly fueled by the growth in distributed resources, particularly rooftop solar PV. And I think this is in contrast to other places in the United States um, on the mainland, which have seen uh, growth in utility scale solar PV. But in Hawaii, like I said, it, the solar PV has historically been um, on the distributed side. So across the state, uh, between about 15% and about 20 or about 20%, depending on the island, of all residential customers now have PV systems on their um, uh, serving their their needs or some portion of their needs, and that that it's, it's it's higher if you're just looking at single family homes. It's about 30% of of all single family homes um, in the Hiko Company service territories have PV. And looking forward into 2020 and and out to 2030, we're expecting you know continued growth in distributed PV. Um, and we're, we think that that will be bolstered with, with increases on the utility scale side as well as larger projects are start to be solicited in a competitive procurements. Um, and so on the sixth island, the island of Kauai, um, this, is, this is an island served by a cooperative utility. Um, customers there have benefited from early adoption of utility scale PV and storage. And so that's significantly boosted the, um, the RPS, or Renewable Portfolio Standard Achievement there. Um, and in contrast to some of the other islands here, Kauai does not utilize wind or, or geothermal resources, um, and, but they do have a relatively diverse portfolio of renewables, and we think that'll be the case in the future. Um, Kauai is expecting to continue to add more PV and storage projects, um, and, as well as potentially pumped hydro. And they, they're forecasting to achieve potentially as much as 70% renewable um, as early as next year and, um, and continue on from there. And I think the, the dramatic cost declines in the technology, uh, for, for particularly for solar PV as well as energy storage, um, have really, really um, suggest that, that we may be able to achieve some of our goals even faster than, than the um, this statutory timeline. Um, in the last several years, all of our electric utilities have announced these new projects for renewable renewables paired with long duration energy storage at record setting prices. Um, the prices have come in around the most recent solicitation now eight eight cents to ten cents for PV paired with storage, and this is four hours of storage. Um, and the PUC just just recently approved six of these projects. Um, this, these, these compare to our, our relatively high avoided costs um, of about 15 cents for electricity generated from oil, which is a predominant fuel here. Um, and these projects are, are provide a lot of um, flexibility for the utility. Um, they provide energy and capacity, but they also provide um, essential grid services that will enable the utility to decommit some of the conventional power plants um, and rely more on renewables. Um, so now I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the, the technical challenges that are, we're facing here when, when integrating a lot of, of renewables. So we know that there's historically a tendency to focus on the supply side, um, and this makes a lot of sense, I think. But, um, but as going forward, we see the demand side of the equation as really the a critical piece of achieving our goals, um, especially as we get closer to the 100% target. And I think we've really just scratched the surface of what's possible in terms of shifting and shaping um, electricity demand using demand side resources such as energy efficiency, storage, um, controllable or flexible demand, electric vehicles, um, et cetera, to enable more cost effective integration of all of the renewable resources that we have. So um, in, in the longer term, uh, Hawaiian Electric plans for um, about 2,400 megawatts of additional distributed PV, um, and that includes a substantial quantity of, of energy storage at the distributed level as well. 
So this is, a, you know, a remarkable scaling up of demand side resources. And we're starting to see that energy storage is being paired with residential and, and small commercial PV routinely now. Um, and this is due to several policy changes that we've implemented over the last few years, which I'm going to go into in more detail. But the basic um, takeaway is that between 75 and 80 percent of all new residential or, or small commercial PV systems are now being paired with storage as they're going in um, in Hawaii. So here's um, a, a kind of an oversimplification of some of the integration challenges that um, we're, we've been dealing with uh, with some of the distributed uh, renewables. So this, this table comes from a, a staff paper that the PUC issued a couple of years ago um, and describes some of these challenges. So the table is organized um, in terms of the roads here, system level challenges, bulk power system level challenges, as well as um, more localized distribution circuit level challenges. And in the columns, um, you'll see they're differentiated between uh, steady state operations or normal or typical grid conditions and contingency events, which are which refers to unexpected or unplanned uh, events. And the good news is that in the last several years, um, the, there have been solutions or, or mitigations for most of these technical challenges have been developed and implemented here. Um, and, and key areas of focus remain the bottom left um, box where, where basically the design of the current distribution system doesn't always accommodate the influx of energy that comes from these customer sited resources. Um, and, and on a, pos a similarly positive note, I think the, the PUC recently approved a series of grid modernization investments that, for the utilities to make, which will complement a lot of the efforts that are ongoing to address these circuit level equipment limitations. Um, and we'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that too uh, later. So we currently have uh, dozens of, of major electricity proceedings or dockets as we refer to them open uh, on a wide range of issues. And I'll just summarize a couple of the key ones um, for you right now. So um, I think, well, the main one here is at the top, the distributed energy resources proceeding. Um, and the, the numbers that are below these refer to the, the docket numbers themselves, which would enable you to, to find the materials related to these proceedings on our website. Um, and so this, this docket, um, we've developed um, new interconnection requirements for distributed resources, as well as new tariff options um, for customers that want to interconnect. Um, we've also got the demand response portfolio where we're enabling um, both competitive solicitations as well as tariff options for uh, procuring grid services from distributed resources, uh, ancillary services. But, but these, these resources could include PV and storage, but could also include um, load, actual customer loads can provide some of these services as well. Um, grid modernization, as I mentioned, we uh, just recently approved the first phase of the utilities investment in, in modernizing the grid. Um, and these technologies and, and software that, they're, that uh, they will be purchasing and installing will help with dispatch of customer load, um, sensing, communications, et cetera, um, help get better visibility and control out to the edge of the grid. And finally, we have a, a new uh, planning process called integrated grid planning, which is just getting underway this year. We'll continue for another um, uh, 18 to 24 months from now. Well, we're, we're attempting, the utilities are attempting to integrate the, what was previously disparate planning processes in generation, transmission, distribution, um, as well as, as do a more accelerated competitive solicitations and procurements um, for grid infrastructure and grid services, including non-wire solutions. Um, so this is a very ambitious and um, challenging effort um, that's underway now. So in terms of the, the recent policy changes related to distributed energy resources, so we've developed several new tariffs um, or, or DER program options for customers. Um, one uh, we refer to as self-supply. This is a non-export program um, for customers that 
would like to have a streamlined path to interconnect, um, and they and in exchange they agree to not export back onto the grid. So these are these are systems that are designed to offset on-site energy needs um, with customer generation, and you can do that in a n number of ways. Um, that could be managing your load to align with the available generation, or it could involve um, energy storage to help with that as well. Um, and uh, these systems are designed to minimize or you know, potentially be, be positive, have positive impact on the grid. Um, and so they get a fast track interconnection approval um, and the utilities and, and with the help of stakeholders have developed the technical specifications for, to enable these kinds of systems to be interconnected quickly. On the second category, uh, is a, we refer to as grid supply. And so grid supply is where, similar to, you know, to, to like net metering or, or prior, prior programs where customers, they are allowed to export um, to the grid when they would like um, for credit. Um, they can offset their retail um, consumption um, through the, you know, through the generation that's coming from their, their systems and get credit at the retail rate for that, um, similar to what Ignacio was talking about. It's a net billing arrangement. Um, and exports are treated as, as a wholesale um, energy supply and credited accordingly. Um, but these systems also incorporate the option for the utility to control or to limit export to the grid um, during emergencies or, or in times when, when that would be needed. And finally, we have what we call the smart export program. And this is designed for customers who are sure that they want to invest in storage. Oh, I sorry, I should have mentioned for the grid supply option, because the utility has the ability to control or limit the exports when needed, um, that program is, is set up for customers who don't necessarily want to invest in storage. Um, but for smart export, that's primarily designed for customers who do want to invest in storage technology. Um, and rather than, than providing for explicit utility control, um, we use price signals to, to signal to customers um, when, when export is needed or beneficial to the grid and when, um, when it would be you know, less desired. So for example, customers on the Smart Export Program currently would receive no credit for any export to the grid um, during the middle of the day when we have high amounts of, of solar already on the system and, and grid um, integration challenges you know, are still a concern at that time. However, export, um, the credit rate for export is quite high uh, during the peak load period when, there's, when there, we have capacity challenges and we actually need more energy on the system. So uh, we have the ability to adjust those prices over time as well. And so as conditions on the grid change, um, we can make adjustments to the pricing and, um, and you know, the, that will flow through in terms of the, the uh, signal and incentive to customers. And on the, the technical side, um, this proceeding involved developing new interconnection requirements for DER, including requirements for advanced inverter functions. And uh, given all the, the growth in distributed PV, we haven't been able to wait for national standards um, to be updated or adopted. Um, and so we've had to work with utilities um, and, and key stakeholders here to identify the most critical needs on the grid, um, what the capabilities are of the technology and equipment, um, and implement them through interconnection requirements immediately um, and incorporate those into our standards here. So in particular, we've identified that frequency disturbances um, you know, necessitate uh, wider ride-through settings for um, PV systems so that they don't trip offline when we have frequency disturbances on our smaller grids. And, and that, was, that was initially um, the, main, the main concern and the highest priority. More recently, um, advanced inverter functions that help to regulate voltage have been identified as needed, and, and we've made changes to the standards to require those, that functionality as well. Um, which has the added benefit of making it easier for, for everyone to interconnect to the system because of the um, voltage issues are, can be a constraint for, for new customers to sign up. So I'm going to talk a little bit about a couple of improvements um, that we've been pushing our utilities to make. Um, so one is, is 
is uh, something called hosting capacity analysis, and, and the commission here has encouraged utilities to improve their methodology and approach, um, and this is for how they review and process their interconnection applications. Um, and, and so this, this, this improvement and, and a couple of the other ones I'll talk about, I think these have been really helpful for customers, and they've also been helpful in reducing the burden on the utility in terms of the review and processing of these applications. So hosting capacity analysis, this is an emerging area. Um, it's getting some attention in some other jurisdictions. And in Hawaii, actually, the stakeholders here pioneered um, some of these approaches back in 2011 and 2012. But over time, I think we've, we've fallen behind some of the more advanced analyses that are be, being done in California and, um, and elsewhere. So we're playing a little bit of a catch up. But, but here's a, this, these slides, or these, uh, these are screenshots from a Google Maps type of, of interface that, um, that customers can access and, and solar installers can access on the utility's website. And they can easily see and visualize grid saturation issues. And so this is an um, image showing the island of Oahu, which is where um, most of the population is in Hawaii. And you can see the red shaded parts um, are signifying areas with very high DER adoption already. Um, and that means that there could be additional study would be required or potentially even grid investments or upgrades would need to be paid for by customers um, to enable interconnection in those areas. But on the other hand, you can see there are a number of areas, um, in particular, I've zoomed in on the, on the right side of the slide there, that's, that's Honolulu, um, that's kind of the urban core. And, um, and there's a number of areas in, in blue and green where, um, where DER adoption is not as high and, and um, interconnection should be more streamlined and, and, and significantly less costly in those areas. Another improvement um, that we, the Commission required Hawaiian Electric to develop a transparent and publicly accessible interconnection queue. And, um, and this uh, lets customers see where their project sits relative to others that have applied to interconnect. And this is a web-based tool as well, and it, it, they can understand the overall process and helps, also helps keep the utility accountable um, to meet you know, and process interconnections in a timely way. I think this is a helpful thing for, um, for, for both sides as well. Um, and finally, I, I just wanted to highlight that the commission has asked, asked Hawaiian Electric to develop a grid modernization strategy, um, which they worked on in, in 2017 and 2018. And the commission has just recently approved um, phase one of, of this project, uh, which I think will be really useful going forward to enable further growth in the, on the distribution system. So these are these the grid modernization investments that they're planning to make include <clears throat> advanced metering, of course, but also the sensing and communications infrastructure, the automation and control infrastructure that will enable the utility to better vi have better visibility into the grid, especially towards the edge of the grid, um, and, and also better control over the grid as well um, to improve reliability. Um, so we just approved this, this investment, um, this set of investments, and we would expect that there will be further follow on um, as we move into the future. Um, so this concludes my presentation, and I just wanted to thank you all again for the opportunity to speak with you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have uh, later on during the webinar. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much, David. Um, we are now going to pass the microphone and controls over to another David, David Brown, who is the Principal Distribution System Engineer for the Sacramento Mun Municipal Utility District. So I'd like to welcome David Brown to the webinar. David? Good afternoon, or evening, depending on where you are. Um, I just thought I'd start out with uh, a brief background of the company that I work for, the Sacramento Municipal Utility District. We're located in Northern California, and one of the great things about it is we have plenty of sunshine. Uh, we've uh, we've got we're one of the larger municipal utilities. We're not really owned by the city or the county. We're kind of a private entity of the state of California. Um, about 2,000 employees, and uh, 
we're just about to finish a, a feed-in tariff project that's about 150 megawatts that will bring our total up to 460 megawatts of PV. Um, but I, for, for this discussion, I, I thought I'd focus on the residential and small commercial uh, solar process, the rooftop solar. Probably about half of our PV is large utility scale fields because we still have a little bit of land available. Um, but uh, if you can see the slide here, this is this is kind of what the world looked like when we started. A, a, this um, this is a depiction of a neighborhood. Each one of those squares is a lot, and the ones with the PV in the middle are the ones that have PV. And you can see that is like one per transformer, maybe two per transformer. Uh, life was easy when that was the concentration we were working from. Um, one of the uh, challenges was when we when we were working back in those days, uh, we had just got this GIS system. It came in in 2000. It's been really useful for us knowing what we have and what we're connecting to. Um, but uh, at present, we're now show the next slide. We've we've got developments that are virtually 100% solar and uh, those developments um, are only going to expand now that uh, the state has passed a law calling for all new homes to have solar 100% uh, of the new housing stock starting next year so we're uh, we we went over the past 10 years from a utility that had uh, was receiving uh, you know dozens of applications a month to uh, to a utility re receiving um, hundreds a week. Um, I thought I'd discuss the process. I, 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 it was hit on a little bit in, in uh, Ignacio's presentation, but uh, the old process we had was we'd get paper applications and we had a dedicated solar specialist reviewing uh, those applications. We even uh, went so far as to uh, um, uh, put on training classes to train the contractors on how to uh, design systems and and how to uh, uh, get their systems through the f into the fast track process. Um, and most of what our tracking back then was for was tracking rebates that we were paying um, and queuing up customers so that they could get the rebates. Uh, we've gone past the rebates now and are just largely install, uh, interconnecting using net energy metering. Uh, which is uh, also on its way out. Um, but anyway, uh, the distribution system planner would review pretty much each application single line. And for a lot of years, that was me. Um, and then uh, we had a, a dedicated solar specialist that went out and inspected the installations and coordinated with the city building inspector to make sure that what got put up was pretty similar to what was applied for. Uh, and then um, uh, we'd send paper notifications to billing and billing would send somebody out to replace the meter with a two register meter and um, and also install a production meter which is a, an additional feature that we have I'll show a little later that's uh, I guess a little unique and, and really useful for us uh, right now our process is everybody makes online applications as was discussed earlier um, we've taken all the simple installs and handed them off to our new business designers um, because they're used to working with contractors and the contractors are used to working with us. Um, my office here now only reviews the uh, installations that are a little more complex. We take the ones over 10 kW, the ones with batteries, the uh, uh, commercial installations and, and anything that the designers look at that they think is going to be a problem. So if they see a, a high concentration or any other thing that concerns them, they'll, they'll just send it up to us. Um, we, because we're on more than 90% of our installations, we're setting a separate production meter. And now that we've gone to AMI, we don't even have to change the revenue meter. The revenue meter was all, already a multi-register meter that was bringing us the data. So those meters don't need changed uh, to enable distributed generation or net energy metering. But we, uh, we are installing on most of the homes and we provide them a stipend to pay for the additional socket, uh, a meter that will allow us to track just the production of the PV. Uh, anyway, the process we got since does most of the communications and billing gets updated directly. Um, 
I, I know we're not supposed to talk commercial, but the name of the tool we're using is Power Clerk 2 uh, from Clean Power Research. I'd show you their slides, but they're all proprietary. So uh, anyway, uh, the online application allows the customer to uh, to go ahead and uh, put in the site information, the host customer's name, um, the proposed system information. It, one of the cool things about it is it has a pull-down list that only includes the smart inverters that are approved for installation in the state of California. And uh, it coincides with SMUD's approved list. Uh, that gets us the smart inverters that have passed uh, IEEE 1547 and tested to UL 1741SA. And that eliminates a lot of worries. We just go ahead and hook those up. Um, and one of the neat things about this program is it calculates the annual output for the net energy metering compliance. Our program limits them to uh, the applicant to uh, to just uh, the same uh, up to 100% of their annual usage. Um, one of the interesting things about this is that it allows the applicant to scan in a recent bill a layout drawing and electrical system drawing. The recent bill uh, serves a couple of, of purposes. We, we know what their bill is, but um, uh, having them submit it shows us that somebody got permission and got a hold of the customer's bill. Uh, we don't like to go through this process for people who are, haven't even sold the system yet. Um, and I'll show you some of these in a minute. Uh, the great thing about this program is it auto-generates the status emails to the applicant and the contractor so that as they're going through the process, they know who's got the ball and who's got the next move. Uh, it's really been useful to our customers to know that in spite of what the contractor's telling us, it's not the utility uh, or telling them that it's not the utility that's holding up the game a lot of the time. Uh, this is a picture of a layout drawing. It's pretty simple. They upload it. It gives us an idea of uh, actually where to send our inspector to look. Uh, they don't worry too much about the DC side of the system, what's up on the roof. Uh, they're more interested in the AC panel. Did the right inverter get installed? Uh, did, the, uh, did the order of the equipment on the wall meet the, the size and equipment that they said they were going to install? Um, this is a typical single line that our new business designers uh, look at. Um, and uh, what you'll see here on the, on the left side is the traditional revenue meter, the main breaker of the panel, the distribution breaker that goes out to the uh, solar, and another meter socket, and that's where we put the, uh, the PV production meter. These are uh, automatic meters, so we can read them at distance and uh, uh, it's really great when there's a question about the performance of the systems. The other thing we check is we check simple things for the customer, like did they pick the right size breakers? Did they violate any of the National Electric Code rules? Uh, that way the process goes much faster once they start building it. Uh, here's a, a neighborhood that uh, depicts one that's 100% penetration, and what we've found is based on our uh, our designs that we can get away with 100% uh, penetration in every home in a neighborhood being about 5 kW or less. If uh, in a lot of these developments, uh, when they're when the developer is putting them on, they they go a little smaller than that. They stay in the three and a half range to four range, um, and we don't. It doesn't result in any problems to our system. Uh, when we get clusters like this where they're much larger than that is when we have to start uh, getting creative. We now, and, and um, let's see. So when, when we do encounter these higher voltages and uh, and start dealing with them, that's when, when things kind of get fun. Um, we've uh, identified a handful of things that we can do to deal with voltage rise. Um, with many of our customers, we, it doesn't occur very often, but when it does occur, we've used dedicated transformers. We also already require dedicated transformers in residential when the customer uh, has sized their unit over 20 kW. So that takes care of the 
issue that they might raise the voltage on their neighbors. Um, we can occasionally deal with a voltage challenge by increasing the size of the secondary conductors. And then we can also uh, install voltage regulating transformers. Well, they're kind of expensive. Um, we can enable uh, the smart inverters volt VAR functions. Uh, as was mes mentioned earlier, uh, uh, SMUD and the California utilities all require the functionality of volt VAR, volt watt, the smart inverter functions, but we're not uh, activating them uh, indiscriminately. We only activate them when we need them uh, because it, it does have a small annual impact on the customer's power production. And then the fifth option, which uh, we haven't used, but uh, we've get, we're getting so many battery-based systems that we think we'll be using in the future is, is just employ the battery storage during the times of minimum load. And here in California, Northern California, the minimum load seems to be occurring in April, about the second week of April, when the sun's on just the right angle, there's no clouds in the sky, and the wind is blowing, the temperature is cool, and nobody's got anything turned on. Uh, that's when we get the, the biggest challenge in terms of dealing with voltage. Um, showed here is a volt VAR curve. Uh, for those who haven't seen one before or, or been familiar with it, when you're in this dead band, the voltage is in the normal operating range of a utility, and we don't ask the inverter to do anything. Um, if the voltage drops low, the inverter can assist by injecting VARs into the system and raise the voltage. And if the um, if the voltage is running high, the inverter can draw VARs and lower the voltage on the secondary. And for the most part, we're looking at using this just to have the inverter correct for its own impacts on the system. Uh, some of the other utilities in California are in investigating whether or not uh, this could also be used to deal with uh, deficiencies on the utility, but uh, that's not really our focus at SMUD. Uh, we've, we tend to build fatter wire, shorter feeders, and, and have very good voltage regulation. So it's, uh, uh, we're not really looking to have the inverters solve our problems. Uh, and here's an example of volt watt. Volt watt starts out at a, uh, you, running along at 100%, and as the voltage gets high, it just turns the thing down and turns it off. And the important thing to mention about this is that if this happens four or five or six hours a year, you can effectively double the hosting capacity. And six hours a year of production um, isn't worth uh, making the investment on dedicated transformers and other pieces of equipment. Uh, I thought I'd throw this slide in uh, to kind of show that point. This is borrowed from the Electric Power Research Institute of Palo Alto. Uh, and this shows in the, in the left-hand box that the, uh, the hosting capacity is exceeded, if you look at the, the red zone, as the voltage starts getting uh, above the uh, ANSI standard voltage. And that by, um, by using volt VAR control, you can greatly increase that, basically double the hosting capacity. You can see all the, the points start falling along the line or below the line um, with this application. And it doesn't take um, very much away from the native performance of the units. Um, presently though, probably about 60, 70% of our units in the field are pre-smart inverters. So we're, we're trying to uh, phase these in and uh, the investor on utilities came up with set standard settings that uh, they believe will address most situations. And what we are working with the Electric Power Research Institute, I'm sorry, with uh, NREL, the National Renewable Energy Labs, um, uh, we're working them on a program called Precise, and this program allows us to take a look at the uh, the system, the topography, and create the custom settings that we would need before the customer shows up. So we're not delaying the application process. So we can keep everything moving at, at a fast track, uh, even when we've reached uh, the first st stage of saturation. And uh, with that, I'll ask if uh, we pass.
pass it on to uh, go through some questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much um, to all of our presenters uh, for those wonderful presentations. As we shift to the question and answer session, I just want to ask that our attendees can submit questions again at any time using the question pane. Um, for any questions we don't get to in the remaining minutes, we'll follow up with those attendees afterwards. We'll also keep several links up on the screen uh, throughout this uh, Q&A for a quick reference that point to where you'll find information on upcoming webinars as well as previously held webinars like the other DG campaign webinar we recorded back in April and also how to take advantage of the Ask an Expert program. Uh, we've had some wonderful questions from the audience that I'd like to use the remaining minutes to ask. Um, our first question came in um, during Ignacio's presentation and Ignacio, please um, address it or anyone else from the panel, please feel free to jump in. Um, the question was, compared to cybersecurity concerns of centralized power generation, would you say distributed generation is more or less or equally secure as it's been in the past? Hello, uh, I think this is, a, this is a very important point as we digitalize our grid. And uh, of course it has to do with a lot of more um, technologies like IoT, but uh, as uh, my, 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 my impression is that with the advance of um, smart inverters or inverters in general, and this uh, autonomous self-regulating uh, capacity that they are implementing and they now include, uh, they're self uh, self reliable and they, they don't require to be uh, physically I mean um, connected uh, through a through a, through a network to operate of course in a larger system as uh, David um, uh, as, as both David's uh, uh, explained it might be necessary or it might be uh, prudent to have some kind of uh, control from the utility but I think in general that uh, that might 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 not be the case uh, and in this sense uh, it's uh, it's a lot uh, safer and we avoid a lot of the of the concerns um, I think that that's my my impression on cyber security for for this type of, uh, of distributed energy resource wonderful Dave Brown or Dave Parsons would you like to jump in and say anything more on that Yeah, this is Dave Brown. Uh, I, I just thought I'd jump in and say, hey, as, as long as we um, haven't connected it all to a um, distributed energy resource management system or DERM system, no worries. Uh, but that's where we're going. And in the next few years, we're looking to uh, to connect a lot of these resources either directly or through the cloud uh, so that the utility can access them. And along with that comes the same level of cybersecurity that we uh, use with our large power plants and with our energy management systems. Great, thank you everyone. Um, our next question, um, David Parsons, I'll address it to you, but again, Ignacio and David Brown, if you wanna answer as well, please feel free to jump in. Um, Dave Parsons, what is the maximum credit a consumer can receive via smart export? So, okay, so um, there, the credit is, is calculated based on the marginal cost um, in the time period that, um, that is applicable. And the, the way that it's been set up, at least to initially, is um, there's a, a window from 4 p.m. to 9 p.m., which covers sort of the system peak in Hawaii. And um, the credit in that period is I believe it's it's around 15 cents. It varies by island because each island has a different marginal cost, but generally it's between 15 and, and 20 cents per kilowatt hour. Um, and then in, in the overnight period, um, it's somewhat less, but between 9 p.m. and 9 a.m., uh, it drops down to between 10 and 15 cents um, approximately, depending on island. Great, thank you so much, um, Dave. Um, the next question is for David Brown, 
And um, during your presentation, you mentioned that in 2020, all new single family homes in California will be required to have um, PV. Is this something that um, the utility is ready for, for like the increased number of applications and the timing of how long the process will take? I hope so. Um, yeah, we're, uh, we're getting ready for it. Uh, one of the things that we did get put into the legislation was uh, uh, the option for uh, developers to opt into a community solar. So we don't expect all of them will be doing individual. There might be some of them doing community solar, which uh, uh, SMUD is uh, available to provide. But uh, especially if you have developments that don't lend themselves to solar, uh, multi-story or, uh, or, or ones that uh, are going to have a lot of trees someday. Um, but yeah, it's a... It's going to be a challenge, but that was part of our, our change. So uh, subdivisions aren't tough. Uh, they usually design about five, six model homes. We approve the model and they just cookie cutter it over and over. So that's not going to be a real problem for us. All right, wonderful. And I think we have time maybe for one more, maybe two questions. We'll see. Um, for Dave Parsons, and again, for the rest of the panel, um, are there any key lessons learned regarding DER interconnection that would be good for others to know? Um, maybe best strategies that have worked better than others? Sure, I can share a couple ideas. Um, you know, in in our experience, um, getting started early is helpful. Um, you know, the technology changes and the policy changes and the changes in customer preferences. Um, you know, that, that has all driven very rapid adoption, and I think even experienced and knowledgeable um, market participants and, and others here in Hawaii, I think we're, we're taken a little off guard at, at just how quickly things have evolved. Um, and so, so getting, you know, planning ahead, and I think um, you know, I've, I've observed some of the jurisdictions on, on the mainland U.S. Um, that, you know, have very low solar uh, adoption so far, you know, relatively, um, are already starting to get to get going on this stuff. But I think that's a great thing to do just to kind of get this stuff lined up. It also really helps the market um, develop more smoothly and, and it's just a, a better, better environment for everyone, customers, market participants, utilities, it seems like. Um, another thing I would mention is, is engaging effectively with all the stakeholders is really key. And sometimes this is challenging. Um, you know, it, is a it can be challenging in any context, but but I think um, focus and attention on on customer and, and stakeholder engagement it can be really helpful. Um, it's not just the the solar installers that need to be at the table, but but even the customers themselves um, sometimes, as well as the inverter manufacturers who aren't you know don't always participate in regulatory processes necessarily. Um, getting the, the utility engineers and, and everybody to, to talk through this stuff um, is really important to having, you know, having some possibility of agreement and, you know, potentially durable, um, you know, effective solutions. And then the last thing I'd say is just it, it helps to piggyback on the work that others have done. I think California has been a real leader in this area, and we've really benefited here by, by closely following what California has done. Um, and I think, you know, where we can, you know, it's not entirely the same, but where we can, we'll, we try to um, tailor what we're doing here to match what's happening there. I mean, that makes it easier for manufacturers and installers because they are familiar, um, and it makes it a lot easier for us and for our stakeholders and for our utilities to have a starting place. Um, so th there's more, but, but yeah, I'll stop there. Uh, this yeah, is Dave Brown. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Dave Brown. <laughs> okay, yeah, I can weigh in on this. One of the, one of the things that we've we we've seen uh, the evolution of the inverter from the inverters that were designed to get off the line at the first sign of trouble. It was a really simple inverter, and it was really safe. And then we had had more complex inverters that are designed to just don't make things worse. Now we've got opportunities going forward. Uh, and IEEE P 2800 is designing inverters that are made for the transmission bulk grid so that they will actually make things better. Um, 
And uh, we, I, I believe that the technology has reached the point where there needs to be a diversion between the inverters that are going in on the rooftops and the inverters that are going in the utility scale fields. Um, we can do a lot more, but we can't do it on the, on the rooftops as readily as we can in the uh, larger solar fields. Uh, it's, that's one of the pushes that, that we've recognized because every time the transmission engineers and the bulk system engineers get together and try to decide what they want the inverters to do, they shut off something we wanted it to do for the distribution system, uh, especially some of the safety features. So we've, we've been working in the Rule 21 working group in California here to kind of negotiate back and forth over the last little bit. And I think it's a real breakthrough if we can get inverters that are purpose built for transmission interconnection. Wonderful. Thank you, David Brown. And I think Ignacio also wanted to wrap it up by saying a few, um, an answer to that. Yes, basically I wanted to add on the point uh, of the importance of stakeholder involvement at the earliest uh, stage possible. Basically, the more people you can involve and uh, especially the, 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 the agents that are not used to dealing with energy as the end users or the energy markets i mean or or different aspects or regulatory aspects of utilities uh, as the installers and and so on so everyone has a just a part of the picture and if you if you bring them all on board on the discussion it's a lot easier for them to understand why from uh, our side from the policy making side we're making uh, the decisions and also taking their their feedback and 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 uh, and request to to make it uh, better for everyone. Also, something that uh, that was mentioned is that there are some places and some jurisdictions that have had a long uh, experience with these uh, implementations. Of course, there's a lot of challenges, such as the ones that we've been discussing now, and it's a a, a really amazing field to be involved in. But uh, we have learned a lot from, from, of course, from California, also from the studies that NREL is doing uh, with Hawaii on uh, high penetration impacts. And, uh, and I think uh, being aware and uh, being involved on a global discussion through these kind of, um, of campaigns and, 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 and forums is key to, to share new ideas that could make uh, all our, our lives easier, let's say. And, uh, and push for a, an accelerated uh, implementation of, of renewable energy and distributed wind generation. Wonderful. Thank you again. Um, on behalf of the Clean Energy Solutions Center, I'd like to extend a thank you, a special thank you to our outstanding panel today and to our attendees for participating and hanging on a few minutes longer than we anticipated. We very much appreciate your time and hope in return there are some valuable insights that you can take back to your ministries departments or organizations. We also invite you to inform your colleagues and those in your networks about Solution Center resources and services, including our no-cost policy support through our Ask an Expert service. I invite you to check the Solution Center website if you'd like to have used today's slides and listen to a recording of our presentation today, as well as previously held webinars. Additionally, you'll find information about upcoming webinars and other training events. We're now posting the webinar recordings to the Clean Energy Solutions Center YouTube channel. Please allow a few days to a week for the posting to occur. Finally, I'd like to kindly ask you to take a moment to complete the short survey that will appear when we conclude the webinar. Please enjoy the rest of your day and hope we hope to see you again at future Clean Energy Solutions Center events. This concludes our webinar.